Good morning. Buenos dias. That's all I got. I got, I got. I got nothing else. I was texting, texting with one of the teens at some point in the past couple of months, and I threw out a couple words I knew, and they threw more back at me. And I was like, "I'm, I'm all done. That's all. That's all I know." Uh, I struggle with English enough to. Uh, but you guys are a little bit uh, uh, more saged than the crowd that I normally deal with. Much, much, much wisdom. But um, you can go ahead and hit that button, Stephen. That's what we're going to talk about today. And um, this is not something that you can cover in a Sunday school setting. And so what I'm basically going to do for you is give you the, the rough draft to a Bible study. And uh, it is something I think you need to study. Do something. Just smile for me. I know it's Sunday morning and it's rough, but if you didn't have coffee yet, that is not my fault. (laughs) You did not get up early enough or something or Red Bull because it gives you wings or whatever it is that that you drink. I'm not sure what it is, but you need to smile. Um, We normally play games and stuff. These guys are going to go into withdrawals. They don't get any candy today. Gonna, it's going to be rough on them. But um, Psalm 19 is the passage we're going to start from. And it is a subject that it's difficult because what it does is it, it, it puts a magnifying glass upon my life and, and really shows me how wicked I am. Because we, we read verses in the Bible and we're so used to things a lot of times that we, we don't really truly grasp the meaning of what something is. And so David here in Psalm chapter 19, let's start up in verse 7, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my Redeemer, and my strength and my Redeemer. Much good is in between verses 7 to 10, and uh, even down into verse 11. In verse 13, though, notice he says he wanted the Lord to keep him back from those presumptuous sins. So that points me in the direction that that is something that I will struggle with. If David, who is the man after God's own heart, is asking God to keep him back from something, it must be something that I need to be concerned with. And he says presumptuous sin. So what we generally do is we look at that word and we say, well, I really don't know what that means, so I don't need to be bothered with it. And we just move on. The problem is those are your sins. If you've been saved for any, I I will give you, if you've been saved within the past six months, I'll let you off the hook. Beyond that, this is us. And David said, keep me back from this. The the word um, presume means to, to take for granted. It means to assume. That's a dangerous word right there, especially if you break it down. Or suppose. It means to suppose to be true without proof. In other words, presumed innocent until proven guilty is how our court system is supposed to work. (laughs) That generally is the case, but sometimes is not the case. So when I presume something, it means I'm taking something for granted. I'm making a supposition that whatever I'm going into, I'm, I'm almost coming up with my own definition, which we in this generation are very good at. We have redefined everything. Uh, look at the word, uh, Christian. What is that? It doesn't even mean anything anymore certainly doesn't mean what it, what it started out to mean in the, in, the, in the book of Acts. I mean, we were so far from that. Uh, a Christian is someone that's religious, someone that goes to church. 
Um, and so we've changed the, the definition. So when I'm presumptuous, I'm looking at whatever it might be and I'm determining for myself what I want the definition to be. And so David said, keep me back from this uh, presumptuous sin. Um, Esther 7, 5, then King Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, who is he and where is he that, does, that durst presume in his heart to do so? And he was speaking of Haman, who had presumed that he could pull the wool over the king's eyes and be able to kill all the Jews. That was something Haman presumed that he could get away with. What did he do? He made a supposition. He took for granted that the queen, or maybe he didn't know, was a Jew, or maybe ignored the fact, which we're good at, that it's a Jew. Just because you ignore the fact that what you're involved in is a sin doesn't change the fact that it's still a sin. Just, well, I don't, I, don't like that. I don't like that God says that that's a sin. That doesn't matter. You don't get to choose that definition. You don't get to make that judgment. God has already made the judgment. So David said, Lord, keep me back from those presumptuous sins. Notice that he said, I'm going I'm to get ahead of myself. What is a presumptuous sin? What, what, what are the things that define it? I'm going to give you Spurgeon's definition of it. He said this, now I think here must be one of four things in a sin in order to make it presumptuous. It must either be, number one, a sin against knowledge or light and knowledge. In other words, this. I am sinning against the knowledge that I've had previously that this is wrong. I'm going ahead with what I want to do beside the fact that the sign said 55. I'm presuming that I won't get caught. And then when you get caught, what's the first reaction? You get mad. Why? Because you presumed Wrongly, you assumed wrongly that you were not going to get caught. So presumption is sinning against that light and knowledge. He said, secondly, it is a sin committed with deliberation. It's, it's something that I sit down, it is calculated. It is something I make plans for. And it is something when we talk about in that, that's where, that's where we get jumpy. Because none of us like to admit the fact that we plan to sin. Because that puts you in a category with people that you look down on. You look down on people all over your neighborhood and all over this town and all over this world who planned to sin. Oh, that's just wicked and ungodly. Uh, wait, see, you're just not into the stuff that's open for everybody to see. It doesn't change the fact that it's still presumption on your part. And it doesn't change the fact that you're still going over 55. And it doesn't matter that everybody else is doing it. When, when you're in the middle of Detroit traffic going 85 and a 55 and, and you get pulled over, he doesn't care. He doesn't care that everybody else was doing it. That's not gonna, and he probably will laugh at you. I've gotten one ticket in my life, and I was doing 85 and a 65. And my speedometer was broke. It did not work. But he didn't care. Because I knew that I was going rather fast than everybody else. Everybody else was standing still as I was going by. You know, those things. So there's always signs in your life that what you're doing is wrong. But we're presuming that we're not going to get caught. Thirdly, a sin, committed doing, uh, a sin committed with the design of sinning merely for sinning's sake. You ever do that? You ever just sin because you could? Don't, okay, let's just stop right, right here. Let's pause. Pause and hit the, hit the pause button. Don't be pious, okay? You start being pious, God will put a magnifying glass on your life. Here's, here's what we do. Um, watch several uh, police shows, and one of my favorite things is when someone commits a murder somewhere and then tries to clean it up, and then they come up with the, the magic spray and the black light. You ever seen that? They spray that, this, uh, what's the name of the stuff they spray on it? 
luminol, there it is. They spray that on there, hit the light, bam, it's everywhere. What did they think? They thought they had it cleaned up. They thought no one else was going to be able to see it. And that's how we treat our sin. Oh, well, no one can see it. No, God's got the black light. So don't sit there and say, oh, you know, you're in the wrong building for that. No singing like that will go on today. There's no feeling of that at all. This is what we call real church. This is your mother's church, okay? <laughs> to coin a phrase from years gone by. You know. All right, fourthly. A sin committed through, I love his word, hardihood. I had to look it up because I'm like, I got no idea what you're talking about. I really nothing at all. So it is audacity, impotence, or boldness. A sin committed through, I don't give a rip. That's presumption. I don't care what God thinks. Whew. Wherever you're going to be, tell me, because I don't want to be anywhere near you. Nowhere at all. So that's Spurgeon's definition of a presumptuous sin. I think it's a pretty good definition. All right, let's go through these. And I'm going to try to go fast. <laughs> all right, number one. Presumption allows dominion of sin. Presumption allows dominion of sin. When I'm stuck in the rut of presumption in my sin, I am allowing something to control my life that is not spiritual. It is not holy. It is not righteous. It is not good. And my presumption is allowing that in. Notice what David said in Psalm 19, verse 13. He said, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, let them not have dominion over me. If you have a sin that you cannot shake, a besetting sin, it's going to fit into this category. Because you've allowed something in your life that is controlling you that God has nothing to do with. And David said, keep me back from that. Psalm 119, 133, order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. What is dominion? It is the power or right of governing and controlling. In other words, I'm letting sin govern my life. I'm letting sin govern my thoughts. I'm letting sin control my actions when I'm presumptuous. When I have the attitude, I don't care. When I have the knowledge that this is sin, and I go ahead and step over the line in sin anyway. Spurgeon said this, again, when a man continues long in sin and has time to deliberate about it, that also is a proof that it is a presumptuous sin. He that sins once, being overtaken in a fault, and then abhors the sin, has not sinned presumptuously. But he who transgresses today, tomorrow, the next day, week after week and year after year, until he has piled up a heap of sins that are as high as a mountain, such a man, I say, sins presumptuously. Because in a continued habit of sin, there must be a deliberation to sin. There must be at least such a force and strength of mind as could not have come upon any man if this sin were but the hasty effect of sudden passion. Ah, take heed, ye that are sodden in sin, and ye that drink it down as the greedy ox drinketh down water. Ye who run to your lusts as the rivers run to the sea. Ye who go to your passions as, as the sow to her wallowing in the mire. See, we don't like that context. But it's a good context. Take heed, your crimes are grievous. And the hand of God shall soon fall terribly on, you, on your heads, unless by divine grace it be granted to you to repent and turn unto him. Fearful must be your doom if unpardoned. God should condemn you for presumptuous sin. O Lord, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. When I step into that arena, I put myself in the place of direct judgment from God. But because, and I, I thought about this this morning, because people aren't swallowed up in the earth, but we can't say that anymore. How many of you thought about that, that day that happened? I thought, well, God don't work that way anymore. And then I'll, wait, 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 wait a second. Maybe he does. 
maybe he does. And I'd say this, if God did work that way, if when you got mad at the preacher and stuck out your hand, it froze in that position, Well, that sure would, you know, if the rebellious teenager was put out into the middle of the street and everybody stoned him to death. If the husband committing adultery was found out and put in the middle of the street and stoned to death. See, the teenagers, you guys could handle that when you were quiet on. <laughs> see, we've, God changed how he works and we fit into that age of grace. We're not under the law anymore. But what we've done is we've presumed things upon our lust because of the grace that God has. And minor sins they might be. But in God's eyes, there's no rank of sin. It's all just sin. So when you lie, it is as wrong and as wicked and as sinful as you murder in someone. And when you commit adultery in your heart, Amen. See, this stuff, it just causes you to think. You, and what, I, what I hope to do is you take a little toll inside of your life and just kind of roll things over and see where you're at. And see what things you've kind of got into the habit of doing. Pride. Arrogancy. Backbiting. That's all presumption. You're, you're presuming and you're assuming that God will not judge you. But he will judge you. We say, how? See, that's, that's, that's the interesting thing about being in grace. I don't know. And I could never say, and if you find a preacher that says right now, he is dead wrong. He might, through happenstance, be right that that's how God, but I have I've no guess how God's going to judge you. Because here's what we don't know. We don't know what the first part of heaven is going to be like. And you don't know what heaven's going to be like as a whole. My thought of heaven, I, just, I can't see because I think in a human brain. I can't see of all the sin that we bring up and all the things and all the problems that, that we create and all the people that we didn't witness to. I, I just can't see how you can be in heaven and all that stuff is just gone and it doesn't bother you anymore. I can't humanly, I can't humanly get that. I know that the Lord's going to wipe away all tears, which shows me that there's going to be tears. And I think, Christian, a lot of our tears are going to be over presumptuous sin. Over sin that we knew that we shouldn't be doing. I think I threw up part of this quote for you. I think I did. Yes, there it is right there. I notice he says, I say sin's presumptuous because in a continued habit of sin... There must be a deliberation, a continued habit. What are your continued habits of sin? What are the things that you cannot break? What are the things that you cannot get away from? They're not cute to God. They're not lovable to God. They're still sin. And though they might not be adultery and fornication and lasciviousness and all the words that we go boo at when we read the Bible... None of those. Oh, no, we would, we would ne'er commit a sin like that. But hatred and emulations and pride and bitterness. Oh, we're so good at those because we can hide all of those behind a suit and a tie and a pretty dress. It's sin of presumption. Because what you're assuming is that God will not judge you. And... I, I'll throw one out to you. He might not ever judge you for it, but he might take it out on your children. If in a church setting, mom and dad, you have the tendency to be mad and bitter and talk about people in the car and at your dinner table and at home, little ears are listening. I'm reminded every week how much little ears are listening and how much they gather and the questions that they ask that I'm thinking, where in the, how in the world did you even, I mean, we were talking in deep code. <laughs> deep code. Our oldest is at the point we can't spell through things anymore, you know. <laughs> we still do if we want to hide stuff from the younger two, but the older two, they've got the spelling thing down. And the older one likes to, you know, that's one of her things is she's a good speller. So whenever we spell it, she just likes to say it out loud. I'm like, the point of spelling it is so that we're not saying it out loud. Thank you. 
Captain Obvious. <laughs> Paul said in Romans six twelve, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Sin shouldn't reign and sin shouldn't have dominion. But when it does, ladies and gentlemen, it is simply presumption on our part that God will not do anything and that he will let us continue. And you know, and I'm going to get ahead of myself and back up the train, put it back in the station. All right, number two, presumption indulges the lust of the flesh. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Peter says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So Paul said in Romans that we shouldn't obey our sin and it shouldn't reign over us and we shouldn't obey it in the lust thereof. So what is lust? This thing of lust. Um, one of the things that I've kind of picked up as being youth pastor is that, you know, young people say they're in love. And I've changed it. I still use an L word. It's just not love. I say that they're in lust. That's what they are. Because they don't know what love is. They love Snicker bars and Reese's cups and monster energy drinks. Because they don't have to give up anything to get those things. See, lust allows me to have what I want. And on the surface doesn't cost me anything. But that's just the surface, and that's what the devil is good at doing. He's good at hiding things. All right, so what is lust? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25. If you go there. Proverbs 6, verse 25. Once again, I knew this was not going to be a run around swinging from the chandelier of Sunday school. I was talking to somebody the other day about putting messages together and just the simple point that sometimes you think, boy, preacher, that's just, really, that's just really rough and harsh. You understand the hours I spent going through this and the time that I spent thinking about this already and the work that God's already beat me over in my head over this already? We, we, we lose that when a preacher gets up and preaches. Oh, I'll tell you what, what. No, 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 no. He's already had six to ten hours in that thing reading and studying and God just raking him over the coals of everything that he's going to say. So keep that in context, all right? All right, Proverbs 6, verse 25 says, Lust not after her beauty, where? Where at? In thy heart. So lust, number one, is concealed in the heart. So when I'm a lustful person, when I'm presuming that you're not going to find out, the reason I can presume is because you can't see it. I have a habit of when I'm somewhere... Watching men. Let me clarify that. <laughs> I'll make the statement and I'll clarify it. And here's what I do. I watch their eyes. Anybody, any other guys do that? I do it all the time. When, I'm, when I go in the gym to work out or if I'm out in public somewhere, I watch guys' eyes. It would do this crowd of girls and you ladies in here some good who has teenagers in your home to just sit somewhere, go to the mall and sit and watch men's eyes. Men are wicked. And the reason they're wicked is because it's in their heart. And the only way you can see it is when it comes out your eyes. And they're so wicked, it doesn't matter what it looks like. They'll still look it over. Amen and amen and amen. That's why it matters what you wear, ma'am. Because they're looking you over. That's not even in the notes. That's free. No charge for that. Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. See, that lust is concealed in my heart, therefore you don't know about it, so then I'm okay. And what am I doing? I'm just presuming. I'm just presuming. So then when something happens and everybody finds out, we're all like... <gasps> Especially if it's a pastor or someone like that, we're just, oh, I, I can't even believe that that would even happen. I can. If you're honest with yourself. You know what, you know what your preacher is, first and foremost? He's a man. And sir, the thoughts and the intents that you struggle with in your heart, he struggles with in his. 
So if you want to pray fervently for something, that is my most fervent prayer for him, is that for him to stay clean and pure and for the devil to keep away. Why? It's in there. See, well, I don't like it being in there. I don't either. But it's still in there, and you can't just say, oh, it's, well, it's not in there because I can't see it. Too bad. It's in there. And it's concealed in there. And the point is this. You better keep it concealed in there. You better keep it locked away in there. Secondly, Romans chapter 1, verse 27 it says, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Number two, lust is culturally accepted. Any more lust is okay. Not a big deal. It's all right. Why? Because we're living that verse right there. That's the world we live in. It is okay. K, okay. it is all right. What is it? It's presumption. It's presumption that God will do nothing to me. Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Answer, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by what? The law. For I had not known lust, except the law said what? Thou shalt not covet. Number three, lust is covetousness revealed. You didn't even know that you were a lustful person probably when you were lost until you saw, wait, wait, wait a second. You mean I'm not supposed to do that? And in that moment that you saw that you were not supposed to do that, if you do that from that point on, it's presumption. It is presumption. You are sinning against knowledge that you have. There's a lot of the things the world does that we get upset about, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking, why? They're lost. What else would you expect them to do? I'll tell you what, brother, they're out partying Friday night. They're out drinking. Well, what did, yeah, that's what they live for. They put up with work all week so they could go be drunk all weekend. Who? And then we act like, oh, I just can't believe it. You did. And oh, how soon we forget. We, not me. I didn't. No, it's, I told myself. I got to watch myself this morning. I put myself out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number four, concupiscence. First Thessalonians 4, 5. Not, <laughs> not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now, you've been at Whole Baptist Church for a good bit of time. Give me the definition for concupiscence. Not the one I'm looking for. Jessica, what is it? That's right. Touching the park bench that says, do not touch. <laughs> Pastor Sal is known for that one. As soon as I have a sign that says don't, I'm gonna. And never notice a lot of times it's not even because I really wanna. It's just kind of a passing thought that I might. But then when someone said, no, I'm in. I'm in. I don't even care. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Why? I don't even know, but I'm in. Because you said no. That's kids. That is the definition of kids right there. Kids are mischievous enough on their own. And then you throw the word no, they're in. That was me as a kid. You said no? Okay, I'm all over it. I'm all over it. How bad can we do this now? What is it? That's concupiscence. That's inside of you. So I don't like it. It doesn't matter. It's still there. And when I cross that line and touch the park bench, that's presumption. That God will not do anything to me. But the problem is I left my fingerprint in the paint. So, you know, you ever have a kid eat something? You know, being all sneaky? My kids do stuff to me. My kids do things to me. Like this. Uh, is it Marissa or is it McKenna? One of them is really good at it. You'll be kissing them in bed at night and they'll be like, I smell peanut butter. <laughs> what are you, the detective for the day or something? You know. What are they saying? They're saying that you ate something that I was not allowed to have. <laughs> and I have caught you in your sin. 
and I know that it's in the house. Uh, when Dan and Terry Snow moved out to Maryland, um, they would frequent Dairy Queen after the kids would go to bed. And um, Dustin, when he was, he's not in here, uh, when he was much smaller than he is now, he came downstairs one morning and flipped open the trash can. He's like, I knew it! I knew it! I heard you leave! I knew you went to Dairy Queen! <laughs> kids are good for calling you out. Number five. Number five, that, that lust is charming. James 1.14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You need to understand that your lust is something that it knows what you want, and it's not going to offer you Brussels sprouts. <laughs> summer squash. Who likes summer squash? Depending on how it's cooked, I don't mind it if it's cut up and grilled. That's pretty awesome. But when it's pureed, into an orange slop <laughs> that if you dumped it into a pig's trough, they would all walk away. <laughs> Call my dad out on some hypocrisy this morning. I hope he hears this. I was like nine, eight or nine years old sitting at the table. Last person at the table. Anybody got a kid who has a, is always the last person at the table? No matter what you eat, they're just there. That was not generally me, but there was that orange <laughs> stuff. It was just staring at me. The, the hypocrisy in it is that he didn't eat it. <laughs> but I grew up in a home, strange enough, where that didn't matter. It's a little side note for parents on that one. So I'm sitting there looking at this stuff and looking at it. He's like, you can sit there all night if you want. I don't care. He said, when you get up in the morning for breakfast, it'll be waiting for you. So take a couple bites, you know, stuff it in there. It got about right there. And then it came back up with most of my other dinner. So it all kind of formed on the plate down there. And he comes in and he's like, well, I suppose you probably don't have to eat that. <laughs> I said, I certainly do appreciate that. Appreciate the space of grace that I was granted right there. See, lust, lust for me is never squash. It's never summer squash. It's just, no, it's not appealing to me. Never going never gonna to tempt me. With the summer squash, never going to happen. Your lust comes at you with what you like. And it knows that you'll be charmed and enticed by it. And it knows that you want it. And even when you are dieting and you say no, you still want it. Even when you're juicing <laughs> and you haven't had anything crunch in your teeth for several days, and you miss that sensation. You know what your lust still knows? It knows that you want it. Number six. Verse 15 of James 1 says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin it is finished, bringeth forth death. See, there's a conception there. So that means that there's a little work done on my part. Someone said this that I don't know is one of those unknown statements. It says this, dwelling on unclean thought, uh, thoughts nurtures the seeds of sin in our hearts. Your lust knows what you want and it gives it to you. What is lust? It is lastly, it is the complete package. 1 John 2.16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Say, what does the world offer me, preacher? Well, in their eyes, it offers you everything you could ever want. But as a Christian, it offers you nothing. Nothing that is of God, that is. Here's, an here's a statement by Spurgeon for those of us that have been raised in church. He said, and how much more is, is this the case when the transgressor has been gifted with what is usually called a religious education? In childhood, he has been uh, lighted to his bed by the lamps of the sanctuary. The name of Jesus was mingled with the hush of lullaby. The music of the sanctuary woke him like a mat in him in the morning. He had been dandled on the knee of piety and sucked the breasts of godliness and has been tutored and trained in the way that he should go. How much more fearful, I say, is the guilt of such a man than that of those who have never heard, had such training but have been left to follow their own wayward lusts and pleasures without the restraint of a holy education and the restraints of an enlightened conscience. 
See, it's bad enough that if you get saved out of the world and you presume things upon yourself and you step into the arena of sin that you know you shouldn't be into, but it is worse when you have been raised in a godly home and in church and you know, and then you step into that arena. The Bible mentions there is a sin that is unto death and there's much speculation of what that is. I don't believe that it's a physical death but I believe it's a spiritual death, and I believe this is where this ties in. I believe that if you're raised in church and you blatantly go, I'm not saying you can't come back. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying this. You do greater damage to yourself that is unrepairable than someone that was in the world their whole life and then got saved and then just deals with the baggage that they brought in. See, you were given the opportunity to not have any baggage, not have any problems, not have any issues, and you chose against your enlightened conscience. You presumed that all the stuff that you had been taught and all the stuff and all the training that you had, well, that's just untrue. Because we in this generation are so wise. Somehow Facebook makes us wise. I don't know. I think Facebook makes more idiots than it does anything else. People make stupid statements all the time. Whatever. The only reason anybody's even listening to you is because you wanted to be their friend on Facebook. If it was an actual conversation, they would blow you off and say, whatever. But since it's on Facebook, they read it and go, oh, yeah, that's right. Send it against your enlightened conscience. So how do I deal with this lust? I'm, 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 I'm going to have to. It's not something that is just going to one day go away. I'm going to have to deal with it. Go to Galatians chapter 5 this morning. Galatians chapter 5, and let's look at how to deal with this lust. It is a problem that you already faced probably this morning. At least if you were alive this morning, you probably did. Unless you've been mostly dead all day, then it doesn't matter. You guys doing okay down here? Yeah? Okay. I don't need them falling asleep. I normally read, you know, lullabies and Dr. Seuss to them, so it's, it's kind of over their heads this morning. At least I'm getting smiled at. That's a good thing. How do I deal with the lust? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. There it is. End of story. Just that easy. Piece of cake, right? You'll do it the rest of your life now. Now that you've read that, that statement, there it is. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. These are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Do you ever get tired of that? Or is it just me? You ever get stinking tired of that? Like, seriously? I mean, come on, really? I mean, do we have to? I mean, today? Really? Right now? Seriously? Oh! You ever want to hit something? You ever hit something? Yeah. I remember Adam Bradley one time hit a wall. And didn't measure properly. He should have got out his tape measure and found that 16 on center. He'd have missed it. But he didn't. He popped that thing right on the 2 by 4 Funny thing, the 2 by 4 didn't give. Because 2 by 4s have a way of doing that. Verse 18 says, But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. Verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So, number one, how do I deal with this lust? Number one, I have to live in the Spirit. And how do I do it? There is your formula right there. Number one, you walk in the Spirit, verses 16 and 25. If I'm walking in the Spirit, I'm going to be led of the Spirit, verse 18. If I'm being led of the Spirit, there is going to be evidence or fruit of the Spirit in my life that I am doing so. That's how you deal with the flesh. You make the spiritual more important than the physical. You put God first. When it's Sunday, you come to church. See, yeah, but I had this, doesn't matter. You come to church because the moment that you back that up and you let your lust and your flesh take over, then you're back into verse 17, whether you want to be or not. These things are contrary the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would there, then you're stuck in a battle. See, it shouldn't even be a choice of whether you're coming. It shouldn't even be a conversation on Sunday night. I had that, 
Any, anybody else have closed conversations with kids? I was, the end of my rope was here last night, and I was actually living about right here. And I went and picked out everything. And I got sad looks, and I said, you know what, I didn't ask, and I don't care. This is what we're doing. No, there's, there's no, oh, one day, brother, I tell you what they're going to do. Okay, that's great and wonderful. They might, but let's see. Let's see. I turned out okay. And my dad's ten times worse than I am. You ever met him? Whew, rough fellow. There's, there's your formula. You, but you know how hard that is? That's hard. See, because I live in the world that is associated with the lusts that my flesh likes, that my flesh desires. And the world always does things on Sunday. I never played baseball growing up. <laughs> because baseball team played on Thursday night. And my dad, for some weird reason, had church on Thursday night. I don't know where he got that. Who has church on Thursday night? But we did. So every Thursday night, I'd go into church in the summer, and the baseball field was right next to the church there, and I'd see them playing baseball. And I got so mad and bitter, and I hated my dad. No, I didn't. Why? Because the, the decision was made, this is what we're doing, and when you train up a child in the way he should go, if he decides to go, okay, then that's fine. You've done your job. Sam Gipp, I had a conversation with him one day, and he said, you need to stop that verse, train up a child in the way he should go, period. The end of that verse is not your problem. That is not your decision. If you did your job, period. And Sam Gipp can say that. Because I was just asking, what do you do? How do you handle it? And he said, you end that verse right there, brother, because if you take it any farther, you're taking God, you're taking responsibility out of God's hands right there. That's God's job. And listen, God, and here's, 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 our, here's what we have a hard time balancing. God doesn't make you serve him. And when it comes to our kids and when they get to that age where they're deciding, we still want to make them. You can't make them. That's not a relationship with God. You have a relationship with God because you're choosing to do so. And they need to get to the point where they choose to do so. You look at all of my siblings, all seven of us. We all chose at different times of what we were going to do. All of us. Why? Because dad raised us and he trained us and he let us make decisions. Did some of them break his heart? Absolutely. But if you don't let the kid do that, you making them, that's, 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 not, that's not a relationship with God. That's like making them have a relationship with you. They either do or they don't. All right, secondly, living in the will of God. 1 John 2, 17 says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The wonderful thing is, this world is going to go, and when this world goes, that lust goes with it. We're going to be mostly dead when that happens, so that'll be a blessing. But beyond that, you've got to do formula up on number one. That's how you get out of that lust of the flesh. And if I, don't get, if I don't use that and I'm not walking and I'm not being led and there's not evidence of that fruit in my life, then what I'm doing is I'm presuming things on God. And I'm writing checks that are going to get cashed someday. Number three, presumption despises the word of God. Go to Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15 and verse 30 says, But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. But he, because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. Now, you would be really upset if I said that you hated the word of God and you despise the word of God and the word of God annoys you. That would, that would bother you greatly. And yet when we sin and we presume things upon ourselves, that's exactly what we're doing. We're in utter opposition to what God says and somehow it's okay. 
And I don't understand why it's okay. And I need an explanation someday of why it's okay. I know I'll never get one because it is never going to be okay. Look at verses 32 through uh, 36. He gives us an ex example of presumption in verses 32 through 36. He said, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man that surely, uh, that, that the man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. See, he presumed that it was okay for him to do that task on a Sunday. Boy, that jumps into a sketchy area, doesn't it? See, we're Bible believers, aren't we? Believe the word of God. Until it crosses over into something that I want to do, and then I have an argument for it. I'm a Bible believer. This is the word of God, brother. It's true, every word of it, except for that one spot over there that bothers my sin. And then we get upset. Why? Because we're good at presuming things upon God. Second Samuel twelve nine says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to, uh, to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. What did David do? David despised the commandment of God when he presumed that no one was going to find out what he did. Proverbs one thirty said, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. When I'm presuming things upon God, what does presumption do? Presumption hates this book. Presumption despises this book because this book says no. Or you're doing it wrong. We don't like to hear that, do we? That's not going to work. The way that you're going is not a good way. You should change your course that you're going down. Number four, presumption rebels against God. Uh, go to Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. There are your references there. Let me read you a verse out of Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 43 so spake I unto you and you would not hear but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and went presumptuously up into the hill numbers chapter 13 verses 27 verse 27 says and when they told him and said we came into the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth of milk and honey and this is the fruit of it nevertheless the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great moreover we saw the children of Anak there all right, I have 38 up there, but it should be 28. Uh, verse 29, then the Amaleks dwell in the land of the south, and Hittites, and Jebusites, and Amorites uh, dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. Uh, verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So here we find the children of Israel in that place where God wants them to go into the promised land, and what is their choice? Their choice is not to go. Because the job was too hard. Notice verse uh, chapter 14, verse 1. All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And whether hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt. What are they doing? They're presuming some things that has not even taken place yet, and they're presuming results. What does presumption do? It rebels against God. It is in direct opposition to God. Verse, verse 28 says, Say unto them, so this is, this is their, their um, judgment from the Lord for not doing as he asked. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Go to verse 39. So God told them, you're not going in. 
They had a chance to go in. They said, the job is too hard. This is horrible. You should have killed us in Egypt. You should at least should have let us die in this wilderness. And who are these two idiots that you have leading us? That's what they said. That's, that's, that's my paraphrase. So then God says, fine, you don't want to go in? This is what's going to happen. You're really not going to go in. You're going to die as you walk in a circle in the sand. That's what he said was going to happen. Verse 39. And Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and got them into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we will go up into the place which uh, the, the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies." For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they what? They presume to go up into the top of the, into the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. So their symbol of the presence of God in the ark of the covenant did not go with them. And the man of God said, don't go there, and I will not go with you. Verse 45, then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in the hill and smote them and discomforted them even unto Hormah. What does presumption do? It rebels against, it, it, it absolutely rebels against what God wants you to do. And then after you have rebelled and God said, this is what's going to happen. Oh, no, 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 I'm going to do it now. It's kind of like when you reach for the object of punishment for your children and all of a sudden they're in great compliance with what you'd asked them to do five minutes before. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, you, oh, you mean you really wanted me to do that? Oh, if, I mean, if I'd have known you were serious about that, I'd have been all over it. That's basically what they were saying to God. Oh, you mean you really wanted us to go up there with this sword? Well, I mean, we can go. It's not a big deal. And they presumed that God was going with them. And then when Moses said, he's not going, and I'm not going. And when you go up, it's a really bad idea for you to go up. So they presumed and went up anyways. Gerald Flurry said this, A presumptuous sin is a sin that relies on the success of the past. It is committed with the idea that since God hasn't judged me yet, so he probably won't judge me at all. God forgave me the last time that I sinned, and it's apparent that he did nothing about my sin. Therefore, he will do nothing the next time I sin. And presumptuous sin rebels against God and goes directly against God. Ecclesiastes 8.11, Solomon said, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because we live in an age where people are not swallowed up into the earth and God does not strike people with lightning, we assume that God's not going to do anything. All right, number five. And lastly... Presumption doesn't listen to spiritual authority. And I could have used the last one for that as well. They had the man of God standing before them saying, don't do that. God's not going with you. And they went anyway. All right, Deuteronomy 17, verse 12. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. Spurgeon said, if I have but one check, the check of my enlightened conscience, and I transgress against it, I am presumptuous. But if a mother with tearful eye warns me of the consequence of my guilt, and if a father with steady look and with affectionate determined earnestness tells me what will be the effect of my transgression... If friends who are dear to me counsel me to avoid the way of the wicked and warn me what must be the inevitable result of continuing in it, then am I presumptuous, and my act in that very proportion becomes more guilty. And what does that do for you and I who sit in church every week and are told every week, that's wrong, that's wicked, that's against God, and we continue down the paths we're on? Why? We're just sinning presumptuously, we're assuming that God's not going to do anything. God will do something. You say, what? I don't know. And I really don't wish I could say, because then that points the magnifying glass back on my life. I don't know what he's going to do. I know how he handle. He'll handle you different than he does me. 
He might expose me. He might not expose you. Why? I don't know. But I know this. When I sin presumptuously, I put myself in that category for anything to happen. Because I already know that it shouldn't be happening. Deuteronomy 17, 13, the verse right after. All the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. Pastor has been talking about the fear of God the past couple of weeks. On Wednesdays, I mentioned that. That fear is what keeps me from presumptuous sin. Because that fear is that I know something's coming. If you could go back to your childhood and you had a dad who was a disciplinarian, it's that fear. See, I never got told. My, my dad worked at home. His office was at home. And uh, so it was never, wait till your dad gets home. Dad was always home. And there was always a sound. And if my sister was in here, she would concur. He had a finish nail um, into the wall. And the paddle, it was on an angle. And so the paddle slid over it. And it didn't matter where you were in, in the house, man. And it didn't matter what noise was going on. You could hear that zoop of that handle coming off that nail. And it was just like, <laughs> everybody freeze. If we stand still, he won't see us. <laughs> but see, by the time we heard that noise, it was already too late. He had already put up with whatever he had put up with. Never me, by the way. <laughs> so long. I remember what, I have several vivid things that stand out in my mind. And Paul and I were fighting over, uh, Paul was always instigating stuff. He was just, he was really a terror. And we were fighting over something. I don't even know, it was really stupid. And and I was leaning back on the, on the couch, and he was on the other end, and we were just bickering back and forth, and all of a sudden, somebody pulled my hair from back here. Well, natural reaction, I just reached back and smacked him. <laughs> oh, even so, come Lord Jesus, did not work <laughs> that day. See, but when we see punishment coming, then that's, then, then that's when we want to get right. And then that's when we want to make sure everything's okay. When in fact, the whole time, you should know it's coming. Because there isn't anybody in this room that doesn't know the sin that you're involved in, the sin that you're doing, you're doing it against a holy God who has said no. You shouldn't do that. Don't go there. I'll read you one more Spurgeon thing and then we'll be done. He said, will you just note that this prayer, Psalms 19, 13, was the prayer of a saint the prayer of a holy man of God. Did David need to pray thus? Did the man after God's own heart need to cry, keep back thy servant? Yes, he did. And note the beauty of the prayer. If I might translate it into a more metaphorical style, it is, it is like this. Curb thy servant from presumptuous sin. 